Welcome to 101. I'm Greg Bassett, your host from the Salisbury Independent Newspaper. It's a big day here at PAC 14. We have the boss of Salisbury, the boss of the Salisbury City Council in the house, Jack Heath. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Greg. It's nice to be here, as always. It's another fall in Salisbury, and things seem to be progressing pretty well right now. We're moving quickly, yes. We, we really are. Uh, it, it's good to see things actually uh, continuing to happen at the rate that it has for uh, since I've been on the council. It's amazing. You know, we went through some political drama here with the county recently with some tax incentives for downtown. The uh, city led the way on that. County followed. Thorough examination of this issue. I think it came out correctly. Well, I think uh, the return on investment uh, was well worth it. Uh, a week and a half after uh, the county council approved it, uh, there was uh, dirt filling into the uh, old... Uh, Chamber of Commerce area, and uh, this past week they started driving the uh, uh, foundation for uh, the Ross Building. So uh, that's just an example of, of what can happen when you when you take an aggressive approach to incentives. Right. Tell me what you think in terms of how it, the, the environment is really different business wise in terms of where we get money for development, especially developments that are more than ten million dollars. Yeah. Local people just don't raise, can raise that kind of money all the time. The developers not, aren't there for that kind of thing. So they, they have to crowdsource, basically. Yeah, they, they do. And, and um, in this environment, uh, the investors, the, the bankers, the developers, uh, they, they're looking for a return on investment that you couldn't make on a, on a conventional type loan. Right. And I think that um, what, they, what they really want to see is they want to see a... Uh, uh, some action by the city uh, to make it easier for them. Uh, th this rolling tax incentive as, as a, is, a, is a good thing because right now we're getting a, a very small amount of tax out of that building. It's whatever the building is assessed at. It's like nine or $19,000 a year is all the taxes right. that the county's getting anyway. Right. Yeah. So, um, and by giving them this, this incentive, it, re it reduces the return uh, time for the investors and for the bankers. And that allows them to do these large, very large projects. And it's also interesting that um, once that was passed, uh, other developers have now approached us and said, you know, can we, get, can we are, are we allowed to get in on this? And right. they, we said, sure. So now activity that has sort of was put on the back burner during the COVID time, now it's starting to resurrect itself again. Right. So, I mean, you guys aren't the bankers. You're not, you're not the ones who make the yeah. decisions. You just sort of offer the canvas for these guys to do their thing. Yeah, absolutely. And um, like I said, and one of the biggest hang-ups from the county, there, there were county, uh, some of the uh, county council people said it was going to cost the, the taxpayers money. Well, it's not, it can't cost the taxpayers money because they don't have it. Right. Uh, it has nothing to do with that. Uh, as I said, the, the incentive it starts off at what the assessed rate is now. So um, I think now that that was cleared up and, and it's passed, uh, we'll just see how well this is working. Do they get this or do you have to explain to them what goes on with the taxes in the city? Now, I think most people are pretty savvy with the, with the, uh, with the tax uh, structure. Um, and I, I think the, the other thing is we've been able to do whatever we've done without having to raise the tax rate since I've been on the council. Um, and um, we've had to raise some, like the water and sewer water rate. Water and sewer goes up. Because of the, the water treatment plant and all the, things, right. the problems we had from historically with that. Um, but I think most people are, are savvy. Um, it's not costing them. And as long as it doesn't cost them money now, uh, at some point in time, I know that taxes, we're going to have to look at the taxes because uh, the costs are, are going up significantly in a lot of different areas. Um, but we're also, we're also very good at grants. Right. If you look at the, the fire department, the safety grant from the, from the, uh, uh, that the fire department has gotten, we've been able to add on uh, two sets of individuals uh, at different periods of time, the latest one just we just got the latest one, and that's going to allow us to hire uh, EMS, EMTs, and firefighters uh, to improve the reaction time. Uh, if you remember the first time, um, we were at a certain rate of uh, response, which was below the national average. Right. 
Now we're significantly better right. than we were back then. And uh, that makes a difference. I mean, the fire service, two minutes is a, is a long time. Yeah, we've taken it from something like nine minutes to four minutes yeah, or something. Four, it's, four something. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. And now all three houses have a, a state a, a man personnel in there, right? Which is, which is critical, right? One of the criticisms of grants is you get this money up front, you do the hiring, and then the grant runs out, and then it's stuck as part of your budget. And that does happen, but we've also found that we more grants come in the pipeline. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm amazed at the amount of grants that our people find, and uh, it's not just a grant writer that does it, but the fire department, the police department, um, the roads department, they're, they're always looking for uh, ways to improve our city without having to spend our money on it. Right. Um, it's going to the state sometimes, sometimes from the federal government. We need to get our fair share of that, and we've done a very good job at that. But so much of that funding, it's not Salisbury, you know, wasting money on bike paths, bike trails. There's grants for all this. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's impossible to, like, say no. We don't want that. Well, I, I think that if, if, uh, if it's there, we need to get our fair share. Right. That's the approach we're taking. Um, someone was said to me the other day that, uh, well, you know, nobody rides a bike in Salisbury. And I said, well, <laughs> uh, last two weeks ago, I think it was now, we, have, uh, we had 4,000 individuals well, there's that, yeah. running, uh, you know. But I see the bikes. I, I'm on South Division, and, and I see the there's groups of bikes that uh, come yeah. by in the early morning and the, in the evening. Um, and it's starting to become much more prevalent. And I think the younger generation likes that kind of mobility. Um, I wish I could ride my bike, but I don't have right. the, uh, the balance anymore to do it. But uh, I, I think the younger generation, uh, and we see them using it more and more. Yeah. So the bike trails, the bike paths, that adds to quality of life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what you guys are going to do on Eastern Shore Drive, that's going to also include some bike stuff. and some, Yes. That's going to add to quality of life. It's yeah. just part of the things that make you feel better about where you live and you want to stay there and you want to keep paying taxes. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you saw the, uh, the, the pictures of Third Friday uh, this past week. Amazing. It was remarkable. Um, thousands of people yeah. to come down to Third Friday. Um, actually, you know, you look at it and you say, well, we may have to be forced to open another, close another street for, for Third Friday so yeah. they keep getting as big. But that's what you want to see. I go back to when I first moved here. I can remember going down during uh, the holidays and there were people all over the places. The stores were all open. I think that's what we're going to see uh, in the near future. Yeah. Uh, and it's good to see. It's good to see. We still had a great National Folk Festival this year. Yeah, it was... Um, I've, I've driven uh, the entertainers around for the first three years, for the first two years. And um, last year we had a virtual, so it wasn't, uh, and then this year I drove again. And even though it was more confined, um, the flow was much easier. People seemed to be in a much better mood. I yeah. think probably some of it had to do with COVID and people getting out. Um, but I, ha I had, uh, I don't know if I told you this, but... Um, I had people walk up to me and said, you know, your officers were so friendly, uh, your police officers. And we had police and fire intermingling with the crowd, and, and uh, it was an overall very, very positive. All the feedback we got was positive. Right. And no incidents. Right. No, except for the toilet that fell off the back of the truck That's on right. Carroll Street. Right. <laughs> and that was quite scenic. Really that was, was, yes, yeah. that was uh, interesting. <laughs> But also the economic impact, those numbers that have come out, uh, the attendance was good. I think, what, 96,000? So, yeah. Um, and the amount of money that. 19.7 million. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, it's, it's remarkable because I, I was interested and I actually dug into how Beacon does their analysis. And um, when you think about it, the amount of money that comes into the city through every means possible. Uh, it's not hard when you have that many people uh, to come up with the 19.7. Um, what's remarkable about it to me is that it's a, it was the smaller footprint. And if we would have got the 115,000, which is normal right. for, the, for the third year, um, that would have been interesting. Although we're going to get to see it again, right. uh, which is fantastic news. Um, apparently Peoria, Illinois uh, could not do it next year when they were scheduled. 
And uh, we got a call saying, well, you, look at you guys, would you guys be interested in having a, and before they finished the, the sentence, uh, the right. mayor said, yes, uh, we're, we'll be glad to host it again. Well, you know, it's, it's a shame. First year, like, we didn't really know what we were, were getting into, so there's that. There's mm -hmm. the rookie year. Mm -hmm. Second year was phenomenal. We had great weather, great attendance, just an amazing event. Yeah. COVID last year made it, put it all online. And then this year, post-COVID, uh, so we weren't really able to have a, another full one. So hopefully next year, yeah. if the weather is right, we'll be able to have a real good one like we did the second year. Yeah, I, I think that, I, I hope that's going to happen. Um, we're going to have a good time no matter what. Right. We've proven we can do it in the pouring rain. Right. Uh, so uh, right. I, I think we can we can do that. And um, the other interesting thing is all of the volunteers have now had two two years, three years under under their belts, and uh, it re went like clockwork. I can remember the first year; it was like uh, plugging holes with right. your fingers in the dike. Right. Uh, and and this year, uh, from the from the uh, driver's point of view. It was, extremely smooth. Well, I remember that second year, I went to the volunteer uh, show up thing at the Civic Center, and yeah. I figured it'd be 40, 50 of us, and there were a thousand, a thousand people there. Yeah, <laughs> a thousand people. Yeah. And uh, thank goodness for the United Way with their volunteer center. Yeah. So simple. You go on, you put in your times you want to work. They had everything coordinated, printed out sheets, so it, it, it was well done. One of the themes of this show, as we all know, is I'm wrong about everything. So um, the pedestrian bridge downtown, I was like, yeah, okay, pedestrian bridge, like, all right, fine, whatever, they'll it'll go across, whatever, whatever, it's a big deal. And then we, we put it there, you put it there, it's amazing, and then you have a ceremony, which makes it, was just probably more important than the bridge itself, everyone's all dressed up. Tell me about this uh, Peace Bridge. Yeah, it, it, uh, it, the Peace Bridge is really for, uh, to show our unity with our sister cities. Uh, we have a couple of sister cities. Uh, obviously, the one in Estonia, Tartu, and we were uh, extremely pleased that the ambassador from Estonia was able to attend. That's a big deal. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, it was an emotional ceremony. Um, the mayor introduced uh, the two senators, Senator Van Hollen. Both U.S. Senator senators Carter. were here for this. Yep. Uh, in the midst of all the stuff that got going on, yeah. and, and that was tremendous to have them here as well. Uh, we also had the Secretary of State of Maryland there. Um, uh, so it, it, it was a, an emotional event. Uh, when we went to Tartu, uh, the mayor, uh, Julia Glantz, and myself went over um, and spent a week with them. Uh, and we learned an awful lot. We learned that uh, they have the same issues that we do. I think every city, relatively of our sure. size. And they're, they're a uh, university town as, as well as we are. But at that ceremony, um, it was interesting because I, I saw that beforehand the ambassador was looking at his notes that he had in his, in his jacket pocket. And when he got up to speak, he said, I have these notes and I, I just, I, I'm not going to use them because I, I just want to say what I feel. Right. And he gave a very, very uh, inspiring speech uh, about the importance of the sister cities and thanking us for what we have done. Um, but the bridge itself, I think, is, is key because uh, people said the same thing as you said. You know, why are you bringing a bridge? You've got <laughs> Mill Street Bridge. And you've got, now you yeah, walk around bridges. the building, but it's but, good. But when you, when you come down, the whole, the whole idea was to have a pedestrian way of getting into the city. And after the development for when that, when that happens on uh, Lot 1, uh, you're going to actually be walking right into the, the heart of the city. And um, besides, it's good looking. Right. I mean, it, it is cool. stunning. Uh, they just poured the cement last, I think it was last Thursday and Friday, uh, on the car gated. So <clears throat> um, hopefully that will be, a, that will be a, a big thing for, for us as well. Yeah, because Carroll Street and Route 50, Salisbury Parkway, are like these big moats that keep people from getting from Newtown to downtown. Right. And from North Camden into right. downtown. It's just, it's, a, it's an intimidating cross. Yes, it is. Um, and, and now with the, with the circle, there's only 11 feet you have to transverse. Right. <laughs> Unless beforehand, you used to have to right. say your prayer and run across the, the full width of Carroll Street. Right. And if we ever, ever, ever get <clears throat> 500 Riverside developed there along the river, yes. it, it's going to be right just there. It's going to yes. be great. Yeah. And that'll happen. 
uh, that's, an, that's another area that, because of the way that we're talking about, because that's going to be a big development uh, with the, the bulkhead and, and all that stuff has to be done. So um, th that will probably be uh, eligible for the Horizon program as well. Right. One of the things that's been going on um, in the neighborhoods has been the community policing thing. Mm -hmm. I went to one of the hearings up there at the uh, uh, Truett Street Truett Center. Street. Um, it's, it's fascinating to hear the feedback from, which you hear all the time from constituents, um, about police and people's neighbors and what they see in the community. Uh, some troubling stories certainly are told, but the police seem to be there, they're listening, and it, it seems like they want to do something, they, they want to do better. We're, we're very lucky, I think, to have uh, Chief Duncan uh, as, our, as our chief. Um, one of the reasons that she was hired was because of the community policing that was done uh, in New York, where she, where she came from. And uh, her reputation was that um, she gets out there, and she does. Uh, she meets with the, she has different meetings with uh, different communities, um, is very open and honest, uh, very transparent. There's nothing uh, behind, behind closed doors. So I think that uh, she has established her credibility, uh, which is key. Um, and I think that uh, the task force, they, I think they're due in December, um, their recommendations coming forth. And we're, we're interested in, in hearing what they have to say and, and hopefully we can do some of the things that, uh, that they're asking for and uh, make things better. Yeah, we had a shooting last week, um, which is always troubling. It, mm -hmm. it looks like a social thing gone haywire. But still, it, 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 you know, it makes your community feel different than you it, want it to. It does. Um, it's, it's hard to describe, but uh, it's, when we have one shooting, the whole community responds to. Yeah. And, and you listen to, you watch the news, and horrendous stuff sometimes is not easy to watch the news. But Dover is going through probably a shooting a week or two. Uh, Baltimore's got it. Of course, they're much bigger than us. Right. Chicago's got it. Uh, it happens all over the place. Um, and I, I was having a discussion with my grandson the other day who wants to be a police officer. And I said, you know, when I was a, a, a teenager and, and you had a bone to pick with somebody, most of the time you duped it out and right. it was over. And, and now it seems like the solution to the problem is pull a gun and shoot them. And something is, there's something wrong with that, with, with what has transpired over the years, and we have to get back. Uh, I can remember coming down here and saying that uh, when I moved down here in the 80s, um, everybody knew what was going on. Everybody cared about everybody. Um, when your kids went to the mall, uh, they'd come home and you go, oh, so you were with so-and-so. Right, right. How do you know that? <laughs> I said... Everybody, this is a small I never town. got away with anything. Understand, understand <laughs> you know, understand that uh, people are watching. Yeah. And we know, we, everybody knows each other. Yeah. And uh, so be on your best behavior. Yeah. And it worked. Yeah. It worked. Uh, the movie theater downtown, you, no problems. There were never problems in yeah. the movie theater because all you had to do was call the guy's mother or father. And right. then you, that was worse. So, Yeah. Things, things have changed. But I think that um, we have a better shot at, at doing something positive about it than most cities because of our size and because of the fact that the Eastern Shore is different. And, and I've always said our best asset is our people. And when, when push comes to shove, they all show up. What triggered it for you? What was the moment when you decided you wanted to run for city council? <sighs> um, I used to go to the city council meetings. And uh, if I didn't go, I, I watched them on Pac-14. And um, I started to get real frustrated. Uh, there was a... Uh, there was a show back then. Yeah, I, I often, if I can tell you a story, this is what set it off. When I was working at Lower Shore Enterprises, I went over to uh, testify uh, about a disability issue. And uh, I met with the sponsors of two of the bills that were not going to be positive, and, I, and we went out to lunch. And um, during lunch, the, uh, the delegate uh, said, um, 
boy, you know, you've got quite the zoo over in Salisbury. And I said, yeah, I said, we're pretty proud of it. We have, you know, it's free parking. <laughs> there's no charge. And, and We've got the monkeys. Guy says, we have deer. <laughs> and, the guy, and the guy says, no, I'm not talking about that zoo. I'm talking about the city council. And, and that, the first reaction was, he's right. And the second reaction, I got angry. Yeah. That's my city. Yeah. You know, I, I don't want you to, if they're talking about that, about Salisbury, uh, something's wrong. And I would go home after the meetings and after that meeting and I would say to my wife, Lynn, you know, I, I just, I don't understand. And I would say that every time I got back and I was frustrated. And she finally, in her inimitable fashion, she said, stop. I don't want to hear it anymore. If you're not willing to do anything about it, I don't want to hear it. So I said, well, I guess I better do something about it. And I ran. And I ran for, for council, and I lost. Uh, I ran against Jake Day. You ran against Debbie Campbell and, and Debbie Jake Campbell. Day. Yes, yeah. there were three of us. Yeah. And um, I learned a lot. I, I was, I'm a business guy. I, I never had any experience in politics. Um, and uh, I, I learned an awful lot. And I really felt that I could make a difference. And I can remember, I don't know who it was, but one of the, was one of the, uh, one of the news reporters said to me, uh, are you, are you going to continue to run after your first? And I said, if, if I think I'm doing a good job and I'm still having fun, I'll, I'll run again. And here we are. So it, uh, coming up on my last uh, year and a half. Uh, and I've enjoyed it. I, it's been positive. I remember during the debates, it was funny because uh, Jake would get up and say something, and then Debbie would get up and say something, and then it was Jack's turn, and you would go, well, I basically, I agree with everything Jake said, and I don't agree with anything she said, and then you'd sit down. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was it hard was, for you to carve your own way because Jake was on top of so many things. The, big, the, biggest, the biggest joke was at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the campaign, and Jake actually said it uh, as well, um, by the time the when we went through all the debates and discussions, um, he could start a sentence and I could finish it. Right. Because we really ran on the same platform. Right. Uh, and and uh, except he was a better campaigner back then than I. And um, that was the difference. Uh, but three web races are tough. You know, they, they, are, they are awful tough. It's that's, hard for you to chart that. your own course Yeah, you do. Um, because if, if you really believe in the same thing as another person, right. I'm not going to change my, you know, I'm, right. I'm going to run on what I think is, is correct. So, uh, but uh, it's worked out really well. Uh, Jake and I uh, sort of, I think we complement each other. That's the best way of putting it. Um, we, we meet once a week. Uh, we have uh, good discussions about what's going on, what's coming, what's coming forward. He runs some stuff by me, and uh, I give him feedback, and I have questions, and he gives me feedback. And uh, most of the time, um, we come out with a solution that we can both live with. So, We've talked about this many times. Your experience as a CEO and your training as an engineer um, you know, you read reports, you read budgets, you're, you're not going to just take them at face value, you're going to really drill down on them. Yeah. So like last week when I hear the $14 million impact from the Folk Festival, I'm like, are they padding that a little bit? Jack is going to call them out if they're padding on it. Like you just said, yeah. you, you looked at the Beacon numbers where they, where they found their numbers and yeah. you, you've got no problem with it. And certainly budget time, when there's all kinds of ways to spin spending and you know, you can tell all kinds of budget tales, but when, at that table, and especially with sewer and water, you're drilling hard on those numbers and asking hard questions. Yeah, and I, I think that, well, that's what the people deserve. Uh, we, we need to question things that, that uh, seem problematic. Um, and we have hard discussions. I, I don't know if you remember when uh, we had consultants come in and talk about the, the structure of the, of the monies for the water and sewer with the water treatment plant. Right. And they, they, they came back with, we, you need to raise your uh, water and sewer rates 15%. That's impossible. Right. The, you, we, with our average wage, people on the lower end of the scale 
are going to get pounded. Yeah, it's just not you fair. It's not, it's not right. Yeah. So we went back and we talked about it and we, we hatched it out. I mean, and I think the first year we did a two and a half or three percent and then we did it again. And then this last time we had to do a bigger one because our, of, of the debt calling of the debt. So, um, yeah, I, I look at the numbers and I, and I dig in. Um, and that, again, comes from my business experience, which I think, I think needs to be done more. Now, I will also clarify that when, when I first got on the council, we used to go over the budget line by line. Right. It took us eight hours a right. day for I don't know how many days. Right. And I was like, whoa. Does planning and zoning really need eight reams of paper? Right. No. <laughs> we, we have good, we have probably, and I'll, I'll go on a limb and say, we have some of the best people running our departments that, that are around. Um, so let them do their jobs. Uh, we now get, because of Keith Cordry, who came out of the private sector as well, uh, does a wonderful job. Your finance director. Finance director. Yeah. Um, the way he sets it up, we can now do our homework. I'm talking about the council. Can do our homework. I told them right as soon as I was president, we are not having eight sessions of eight hours. What we're having is probably four sessions, maybe four hours if we need them a piece. And um, you bring your questions, just your questions about the aligned items. It does two things. Number one, it makes them look at it. And you know they have to because that's how they're going to get their questions. So you don't need to go over it line by line. And then we can knock those off. And it's amazing now that when we do the budgets, we have multiple people that have picked up the same line item. And that's good. So that's the way we're approaching it. And I think for the, it's, it's the right way of doing it. And it's proved out to work out all right. Right. I know right now there's talk about we need a new ladder truck. It's going to be more than a million dollars. Million eight. Million eight. No one wants a new ladder truck more than you. Yes. But I also know that you're the one who's going to be really drilling them hard on. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we finally approved it. Um, it it's ordered. And um, we just got four new ambulances. With the number of calls that we run a year, um, we go through equipment. Uh, I'm amazed that some of them, like with the ambulances, I'm amazed that the ambulances last as long as they do. But we have a good model now, and we just got four new ones in a, about a month ago, and uh, they're going to be hitting the road. So, uh, and then we sell the um, the equipment that we have in surplus. We sell it to other departments that don't have nearly the runs. Right. Uh, and so we make up some of the money, but not not a lot. Jack Heath, how can people get a hold of you so they can give you questions and pester you in your they, job they as a council call president? Me, they can call me at 443-944-9353. Uh, if, if I don't answer, I'm in a meeting. Uh, leave a message. Uh, please uh, tell me what it's about so I can prepare myself when I, when I call back. And, um, or you can call the city, uh, city hall and ask for the uh, city clerk, and um, she will get the message to me. He's Jack Heath. He's our city council president of Salisbury. He's a friend of the program. We love having him. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, Greg. Nice to be here. I'm Greg Bassett from the Salisbury Independent newspaper, another edition of 101 right here on PAC 14. First Shore Federal is proud to support PAC-14 and one-on-one. -on -one. We'd encourage every business to support PAC-14 and, and pick a program and support it and let's make a difference.